Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Welcome to our discussion. We're so glad that you have joined us. If you've been following us in the last few weeks, you know that we've been taking a very quick trip through the books of the Bible. And we're quite near the end of the Old Testament. We're going to do something in, in Zechariah this, this session. And so let me read a little something from Zechariah. Turn to chapter 3 and uh, let's start with verse, verse 1. And it's called a vision of the high priest. Now I'm reading from the New King James. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was, was clothed with filthy garments and was standing before the angel. Then he answered and spoke to those who stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, See, I have removed your iniquity from you, and I will clothe you with rich robes. This is kind of interesting, isn't it, Ken? Yeah. Because the, the, the tug of war, if, it, if there was one, doesn't seem to be God between God and Jesus. It seems to be between Satan mm -hmm. and Jesus. Is mm -hmm. there something that you want to fill in there? Yeah, we're going to do a lot of filling in there. Uh, read verse 5, because I think you, you, we should add that to what you okay. just read. And I said, Let them put the clean turban on his head. So that they put a clean turban on his head, and they put clothes on him. And the angel of the Lord stood by. Okay, so here we have They Joshua. didn't leave him naked. No, they didn't. <laughs> but they took off his dirty clothes. That's right. And they put clean, wonderful new clothes on him. And the con well, this is one of very few places in the scripture, just a handful or so, where there's a direct presentation of a conflict between God and the devil. Uh, and those are very interesting places. And we talk about the conflict between God and the devil quite a lot in this uh, group that we have here. And this is one of the places we really would like to focus on and see uh, what it tells us what, about. What do you think qualified Joshua to have his clothes changed? Well, in this situation, Joshua was the high priest of the group of people who had come back from Babylonian captivity. And they were uh, just a... Let me ask a clarification here. Is this, okay. is this something... Uh, is this a metaphor? Is this a vision here? Or was, I mean, I thought Joshua was long before in the time of Moses. Have we got another Joshua this here? This is another Joshua. Yeah. This Joshua was uh, the high priest in the days of, of Zechariah. And uh, in the days when they first came back from, from Babylonian captivity, basically. Zechariah did most of his prophecies, early prophecies we'll be focusing on, happened around the year 520 down to 515 BC and they had come back from Babylonian captivity and probably Zech almost certainly Zechariah was born in Babylonian captivity and came back with the group that came back around 535 so he'd been in Palestine now in Judea if we want to call it that for some 15 years and then the Lord called him to begin doing this prophetic ministry and that's where we start to get these, these uh, messages that we're, we're focusing on. Um, we don't know much about Zechariah. Uh, there are other, uh, there's quite a number of other Zechariahs in the Bible. So <clears throat> you can, be, you can be, become confused. 
Even the New Testament writers got a little confused. Matthew mixes up this Zechariah with the other one that's found in second, the end of Second Chronicles, but uh, that's a discussion for another day. Um, Zechariah is noteworthy for these several prophecies, um, and let's just, we want to come back to the section you wrote about, but let's build up to that a little bit to sort of feel like, get a feel for where Israel is with God. Here's this, like, it's estimated it's one or two percent of the Jews came back from Babylonian captivity to Palestine. A ragtag bunch of people, they arrive in Jerusalem, said, okay, here's our headquarters, and it's a pile of rubble. Nothing but rocks has been completely demolished, flattened, etc. And welcome home, folks. You know, what, what happens under those circumstances? They tried to build, they tried to clear off the top of the, the, the Temple Mount and put up an altar. No walls around, no building, no nothing. They were even opposed in doing that. Um, and everything they tried to do, the Samaritans would, or the other, and the other people around, the other group around tried to stop them, because they, and they kept sending letters back to the Persian government saying, look at these people, they were terrible rebel, rebels, they've caused all kinds of trouble in the past, don't let them rebuild because they'll just, they'll stop paying their taxes and they'll cause trouble. And it just went on like this. And finally, uh, Zechariah and Haggai that we discussed a few weeks ago got together and they said, people, if we don't get our act together and start worshiping God in the correct way, we're never going to amount to anything. And they did. And over a period of about four years, they rebuilt the temple. Now, this is not the city. This is not the wall around the city. That comes later. We talked about that earlier when we were discussing Ezra and Nehemiah. But uh, then we got some of these a little out of, out of order chronologically. But uh, now Zechariah and Haggai are focusing just on building the temple, and they got it, they got it done. Why, uh, why is this temple so important? Was it all that important to God? Well, I mean, that's a, that's a fair question. Uh, he told Moses that their worship was supposed to be centered in this temple. It was located in one place. They were not supposed to have temples located anywhere else. Now, they had synagogues later much later in, in, in times of Jesus and a couple hundred years before Jesus, they had smaller worship places, but they were not, they were not allowed to bring sacrifices there, to offer them to any of that kind of stuff. That was done only at the temple. So there was this one spot where they were supposed to come and worship. And that's because that's where God was. Well, that was the implication. Um, and it's pretty clear, if you go back all the way back to the book of Judges, and some of those early books figure out why that was, because as soon as they started worshiping in other spots, bang, suddenly, um, almost immediately, there would be a new group of priests, and pagan worship would, 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 take, over. would take over. Yeah. So they, they th are they thinking, um, well, they're assuming that this is what God wants. Yes. And um, Well, if these two prophets are leading out, and they're right. receiving messages from God, then they felt fairly comfortable in saying, yeah, this is what God wants. So they, are they assuming that when we get this up and the Shekinah is going to return? Well, that was probably their hope. Yeah. We don't have any evidence that that ever happened. But uh, the actual physical presence, presence that was most notably in the time of Moses and, and even in later in times. All of that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, there was a prophecy that said that something was even greater was going to come to that mm -hmm. temple. And that's in Haggai that we talked about, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, we believe was the presence of Jesus mm -hmm. that come hundreds of years later. Um, there's a summary of the book of Zechariah I would like to take a moment or two to read, found in the Message Bible. Zechariah shared his with his contemporary Haggai the prophetic task of getting the people of Judah to rebuild their ruined temple. Their preaching pulled the people out of self-preoccupation and got them working together as a people of God. There was a job to do, and the two prophets teamed up to make sure it got done. But Zechariah did more than that, for the people were faced with more than a ruined temple and city. Their self-identity as a people of God was in ruins. Now, we, we need to sort of get a feel for that, uh, and, and he, do you need to understand the historical background to sort of really get a picture of that. Here was a group of people who really believed that they were God's true people. 
that if they did everything right, that they would rule the world. That was their idea. You know, the day, they, th they looked back to the days of David and Solomon, and they said, man, we should rule the world. Well, now, here they come, and n most, most of the Jews even, by far the majority of the Jews, 95% or more of the Jews, didn't even bother to come home. They stayed over in Babylon, and Persia, and the, what we would call today Iraq and Iran, they stayed over. They didn't bother to even come home. So here you have this tiny little pittance of people that came home, and they're saying, and we're going to rule the world? What do we have? And over a period of time, and we'll, we'll discuss this as we move on, they gradually came to the idea, well, the thing that we have that sets us apart is God's Word. And so they started to make that the big thing. We'll talk more about that later. So, for a century, they had been knocking around, knocked around by the world powers, kicked and mocked, used and abused, this once proud people, their glorious sacred history starred with the names of Abraham and Moses, Samuel, David, and Isaiah, had been treated with contempt for so long that they were in danger of losing all connection with that past, losing their magnificent identity as God's people. Now this is, uh, this is at the end of that 70 years captivity, mm -hmm. is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Which a little is, ways past it. Which is the one that God sent them into. Yes. Zechariah was, or God allowed them to go into, God, Zechariah was a major factor in recovering the magnificence from the ruins of a degrading exile. Zechariah reinvigorated their imaginations with his visions and messages. The visions provided images of a sovereign God that worked their way into the lives of the people, countering the long ordeal of debasement and ridicule. The messages forged a fresh vocabulary that gave energy and credibility to the long-term purposes of God being worked out in their lives. But that isn't the end of it. Zechariah's enigmatic visions, working at multiple levels, <laughs> and his poetically charged messages are at work still like time capsules in the lives of God's people, continuing to release insight and hope and clarity for the people whom God is using to work out his purposes in a world that has no language for God and the purposes of God. And of course you could guess who he's talking about there. He's talking about people in our day, isn't he? Well. To give us a little bit more background to this whole thing, look at Zechariah um, 1, verse 15. I'm going to read from our, my Good News Bible. Zechariah 1, 15, to get a, get a little bit of background here. Um, and I am very angry, this is God speaking to the prophet, and I am very angry with the nations that, enjoyed quiet in, that enjoy quiet and peace. For while I was holding back my anger against my people, those nations made the sufferings of my people worse. So that's our first big question in the book of, of, of Zechariah. What's God saying there? Is he saying that I intended for my people to go into captivity, but I allowed the Babylonians to come do it, and they did worse than I wanted them to do? Does that mean God is not in control? What, what's he trying to tell us here? Well, this, uh, the New King James has a little different. I am exceedingly angry with the nations at ease. For I was a little angry. And they helped, but with an evil intent. Mm -hmm. Okay. So does God ask, if we go back to Isaiah, we find a place that God says, Nebuchadnezzar and Cyrus are my servants. Yeah. God sent them. But so not, what's going but on But not here? because they were such in such good tune with God. <laughs> no. They, they had their own agenda. They had their own agenda. So how do we put this together? Does that mean that God sometimes controls things and sometimes allows things and sometimes things get out of hand a little bit? Well, we? he sent them down there and he's, now he's got to have a rationale from bringing them out. Okay. <laughs> and yeah. so he says, well, they went a little too far. They, they didn't do it for the right reason. They did what okay. I wanted. They corrected Israel, mm -hmm. but they did it for the wrong reason, so I can't leave them down there. I see. Okay. How, how could they have corrected Israel when, when after the 70 years is up and it's time to come back, Israel doesn't want to come back. They want to stick down there in those foreign lands. I can't say one, one, one percent of the people wanted to come back. But the ones that did come back, wanted to, through the help of the prophets, wanted to worship God in the right way. Some of them. 
Yeah, and, and enough so that they wanted to make rules and regulations uh, that proliferated so that they would do everything God said. So there, so when they were taken into ba Babylonian captivity, there wasn't anybody like that? There wasn't 1% of the people in Jerusalem that were like that when they were hauled off down there? It was just 100%? Well, there's a verse that responds to that. Let's work our way through the book of Zechariah. Go to chapter 2, verse 8. Actually, let's, let's, uh, let's start with verse 6. And my version says, The Lord said to his people, now again, God is talking, and this, by the way, is Lord in small caps, which in most English Bibles means Yahweh we're talking about, said to his people, I scattered you in all directions. That would be the, the exile, right? The captivity. But now you exiles escape from Babylonia and return to Jerusalem. Anyone who strikes you strikes what is most precious to me. And if you have one of the more traditional translations, it will say, strikes the apple of my eye. Now, In the New King James. Yeah. So what is God trying to say to us there? Is he saying that he really likes Jews and only puts up with Gentiles when he has to? No, he hasn't given up on the Jews. He had to put them through an awful ordeal to make them feel bad enough and hit bottom to to come back the few that did did they come back what was uh, the reason for using this this name of god y yahweh. yahweh yeah as that's opposed his personal to name that's the personal name of god what is the significance when you use it though here well he, he's clearly identifying this is i am the god of israel this is my name I'm not Baal, I'm not the Queen of Heaven, I'm not any one of Ashtaroth, I'm in a, a gazillion other gods that they worshipped. The, the I Am? Yeah, this is the I Am. Okay, now th another question is, um, he seems to th say that, um, that God commanded these other nations to come and do in uh, the Jews yeah. type of thing. How did he do that? Did he actually send angels to these um, kings and say, you need to attack the Jews? Or no. was it kind of providential? They were already predisposed disposed to go <laughs> doing what it is, and he just kind of throttled it. Well, yeah, I, yeah, I know, but uh, exactly. how's that going to... How did he throttle it? Kind of like the snakes in the desert. He how, just withdrew a little bit. Right. <laughs> yeah, but how would you actually see God doing that? As well, that's the question to, I asked you. The message, sorry, the Message right. Bible has a slightly different slant okay. that I haven't heard at all yet. I feel, I feel very possessive of them, in other words, the Jews. I am thoroughly angry, angry with the godless nations that act as if they own the whole world. Yeah. I was only moderately angry earlier, but now they've gone too far. I'm going into action. But it, they got grandiose. They went beyond anything he was going to allow them to do. I get from that. Yeah. Well, well, then, then he's, then he should have had some sort of control, right? Yeah. Well, did he? For, first, he said that he, he got these nations to do his job for him, and then he says, "Oh, they went too far. I'm sorry." So, and the critics, the the biblical critics, would say, "What really happens is that God wasn't involved at all." He just makes, he, he got his people to write these things to sort of fit what happened. But he, he really wasn't, I mean, God's not involved. He probably, maybe he doesn't even exist. He just got a bunch of people who wrote these books to make it sort of fit what happened. Uh, my question is, why is he involved at all? I mean, this is a losing proposition when we know, follow, I mean, what have we got here? Another couple of books here at the end, mm -hmm. and it's not going to get any better. It's, it's well, that's one of the big questions uh, we're going to so, ask. It, so it, I, you, get, you, you get warmed up because I'm going to come back to you with that question. Why, why in the world is he fiddling around here with him? And it, we follow this on into the New Testament and finally has to give up on the whole thing or, you know, and... and What's the point? The point, right, is, yeah, what it, why, the why? point is what it says about him, not what it says about Israel. Well, not only that, but there were some events that needed to take place yet with the Jewish people. One thing is the Messiah hadn't uh -huh. shown up yet. Yeah. So what is he going to do? Just let all that evaporate? And, uh, sorry, it didn't work out. So well, that's he's going to have to so, do that. 
So why did he work with the Jews? That's the question. And, and you can see, I can tell you that the, the, the book of Zechariah is one of the, by, well, I shouldn't say by far the best. It's one of the favorite books of the Jews because it has things like this in it. You're my precious people. I'm going to rescue you. I'm going to make you. And he finds it ends up saying all the rest of the nation is going to crowd in. They're going to want to worship. They're going to, they're going to bring their money. They're going to you know, bring it to the temple in Jerusalem, et cetera, well, et cetera. They sure needed encouragement. You only had yeah. those little bunch of people there. Agreed. They used to have this big, big nation that yep. did, did about rule the world with, with Solomon. Mm -hmm. And He's been saying that century after century after century. And you know, where are we getting? We always yeah, get remnant. That's right. And, and you would almost, oh, I hate to be heretical about my own Christian brothers, but, yeah. you know, how are things any different today? Well, that's the ultimate question. You see, if you believe, as many churches would suggest, including ours today, that the goal is to get as many members as possible, God has done a lousy job. I mean, look I mean, at the that, end of the... What is he accomplished I'm by I'm not the, at all sure that assumption is correct. Well, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm challenging you need to think about that. See, if you, if you look at the Old Testament, what is... If you look at the Old Testament, the end of the Old Testament, where are the millions of people who've joined God's side? You look at the end of the ministry of Jesus Christ, and even his disciples are behind locked doors saying, please, we don't want to be the next one crucified. I mean, what has he accomplished? So we, we have a tradition here of lots of expectations, but nothing happens. Lots of promises. Lots Big of, promises. Well, they <laughs> seem to come true, but not towards our expectations, not to um, be within our expectations. At what level of the expectation does it come true? I don't think that numbers have ever been the game. You be, I, let me be your God. And I'll your, and I'll be my people, you be my people and let me be your God. It's that relationship that he wanted. Mm -hmm. it has nothing to do with numbers. And at the cross, he was by himself. But what happened right thereafter when the Holy Spirit came? He had some people that were really in tune with him and they turned the world upside down. That's what was going on. Fully on Israel. Well, it looks like you've taken away the brethren's report card now that if it doesn't matter if numbers well then what are they working for you, you know i'm working for a relationship it's relationship. easy it's easy to say um you know it turned the world upside down but which they did well i do i you know it's easy for me to say that because i happen to live around a bunch of christians but there's a lot of other people that no, never no, even no, heard what a christian is historically we're talking historically they're enemies People in the high levels of the Roman government said, these characters have turned the world upside down. The Christians didn't say that. Their enemies said that. That's a documented historical fact. Well, that, you know, that, you know the thing is... Some that, Roman got carried away, exaggerated. <laughs> that even... Well, uh, hold on now, just a minute before you go too far. You've got to remember that within a couple hundred years, 300 years, it became the official... Religion of the of the world. Yeah, well, no, not the world. It became the official religion of maybe over there in the Western, but the Chinese, they haven't. That people living over in China have never heard heard of, heard of Christians for four thousand years. Okay. Yes. And other places. <laughs> yeah. What we we call that the civilized world. Well, anyway, <laughs> before before we before we get too much further, we have to get back to your passage. What is going on in chapter 3, 1 to 5 there? Uh, is this a depiction of a judgment day? The Lord stands up, and the high priest comes, and he's standing there, and Satan is accusing him, and the, this Messiah, or the Christ, or whoever is representing him, is, is speaking on his behalf, the angel of the Lord, the messenger of the Lord, said to Satan, may the Lord condemn you, Satan, may the Lord who loves Jerusalem condemn you. Notice the Lord loves Jerusalem. This man is like a snick stick snatched from the fire. What significance would this passage have for them back then? 
Well, that's, that's what I'm trying to ask you. Is, is this uh, a message uh, that uh, Satan is here trying to interfere with what they're trying to do with the temple, trying to build a, the temple and reconstruct the temple and, and reestablish? Uh, I, I think this has a much bigger application than just back then. I, I agree, but to them it was back then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they were taking this in, in the context of the Lord is rebuking our uh, our enemies, and he's still going to deal with us. He's still going to make something of us, and they took tremendous comfort in that. Yeah. And what was the accusations? What? Well, what that's would, the question. Well, the but the point is here. Can are we are we are we sure who it is that's doing the accusing? Let's start with that. Well, it says. Well, it says standing right side to Satan standing there to oppose. What do we do with all our Christian friends who don't believe Satan even exists? Well, I guess we feel sorry for them. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, this is one of the verses that's one of the very clear verses. And, and the way it's phrased in Hebrew, it's pretty hard to avoid the, saying this, 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 this refers to a person who's known as the adversary of God, the adversary of the shaitan of God. Same thing with Job 1 and 2. Yeah, so, so then we need to go back to Job 1 and 2. Look what happened there. See, here's Satan saying, you know, the reason Job is, is prospering is because you, you, you treat him so like he's treating the Jews here. He says, yeah. you're a special people, the apple of your eye, all this kind of stuff. And Satan says, if you're going to treat them like that, then I'm going to go after them. And he says, you're not fair. Yeah. You're not fair. He's, he, Satan is the original one that complains about fairness. Yeah. So when people Many say, because uh, God is very gracious and liberal in his blessings. Mm -hmm. and, but they say, oh, you, you know, can't do that. I can, I can see that now, you know, what the significance of it is now. But then, to them, it's a complete mystery to me mm -hmm. what it would be. What I mean, this message refers what, to? Yeah, when he tells them that Satan stands next to the high well, priest here, and the, accuses him. Okay, let, and, me, let me try. And then they pull... He, he answers back and said, this is a brand I pulled out of the fire. Well, I guess maybe they could look at themselves as a brand being pulled out of the fire because they were a small bunch. What they and, saw here from this passage was this. They had come back. They were a teensy bit of nothing in, in terms of numbers. But here they are. They're trying to rebuild something out of the pile of rubble that was Jerusalem and the surrounding territory. And, and they had been in a... A cauldron of 70 years. Yes. And God says, look, he says, if you will join me, if you will stay on my side, then I will defend you. Satan is going to do everything he can to destroy you. Satan is the one who's attacking you. Satan is the one who wants to destroy you. And he's, he believes that he's just got you few here. The people over there in Babylon and, and, and Medo-Persia and so forth, he figures they've pretty much left the fold. He doesn't worry too much about them. You're the people he has to focus on. You need to understand that you're on my side if you will stick with me. And our opponent, our chief opponent is Satan. And so then he's predicting, he's, he's showing here a, a scenario in which he's saying, look, I'm on your side. I want to be your God. Stick with me and we can make wonderful progress. That, that I think is what he's trying to say. So they, they could probably align those accusations with accusations being leveled at them to the king mm -hmm. that they're just going to be troublemakers, don't let them build, and all that stuff when they're there to worship God. They're try, there to now, bring him we're back. we're running out of time before our break. How does this apply maybe to us today? Don't go away.
Welcome back. We're so glad you decided to stay by. Could this passage in Zechariah 3 be a depiction of God's judgment? What do you think? Does this have anything to do with how God's going to judge in the end? It kind of seems to me a precursor to one of the parables in the New Testament where the king goes out, mm -hmm. he's putting on a spread and they get all nice white robes and one guy comes in without and didn't want to put it on. So mm -hmm. he eventually got tossed out. I think it's a similar theory. Well, yeah. What are the items that you'd point to that would give it a judgment feel? Well, here it seems like the people are brought in and there's two sides. One side is accusing, the other side is defending. Doesn't that sound like a court case? Mm -hmm. Christ Object Lessons 166. The prophecy of Zechariah is brought to view Satan's accusing work and the work of Christ in the resisting the adversary of his people. The people of God are here represented as a criminal on trial. Joshua, as high priest, is seeking a blessing for his people who are in great affliction. While he is pleading before God, Satan is standing at his right hand as an adversary. He is accusing the children of God and making their case appear as desperate as possible. He presents before the Lord their evil doings, their defects. He shows their faults and failures, hoping they will appear of such a character in the eyes of Christ that he will render them no help in their mm -hmm. great need. Joshua, as a representative of God's people, stands under condemnation, clothed with filthy garments. Aware of the sins of his people, he's weighed down with discouragement. Satan is pressing upon his soul the sense of guiltiness that makes him feel almost hopeless. Yet there he stands as a suppliant, with Satan arrayed against him. The work of Satan as an accuser began in heaven. This is the work, has been his work on earth ever since man's fall. And it will be his work in a special sense as we approach nearer to the close of this world's history. Wow. Every manifestation of God's power for his people arouses the enmity of Satan. Every time God works in their behalf, Satan with his angels works with renewed vigor to compass their ruin. And we have the page, did you give us a page on that? Christ Object Lessons 166, 168. Okay. So let's think about that. Satan tempts Adam and Eve. They join him. Yeah. And Satan says, I won! God says, no, I have a plan. Oh, okay. So we start working along again, and Satan gets down to the flood, and he said, I've got it, I've got it, I've got it, just to give me a, just another year or two, and I'm going to have this whole thing won. And God says, a flood. So he, then there's Abraham, and then finally we're, we're coming down to the next major time. I mean, what do you think Satan thought when the, when the Jews went into Babylonian captivity? <laughs> got them. Got them. I got them. And now here comes this little tiny group back, and Satan says, just give me a little while. I'll, I'll, I'll get these guys. There aren't many of them. I, I can handle these people. And then, of course, there's all the way through until Jesus, and then there's the Christian church. And every time God seems to start over, and Satan seems to win, and God starts over, and Satan seems to win. Could Satan, that happen in our day? Satan seems like he has a, a great deal of faith. <laughs> Okay. But these accusations, uh, Satan is accusing God, he's accusing Jesus of, be, of not being fair to cause all the rest of the uh, angelic or the uh, heavenly beings. And uh, he's, he's using these people as examples. Mm -hmm. He says, you can't uh, save those people. Look at them, all the bad things. And he's got all this stuff, uh, they spews it out, all their, their record. Yeah. Well, I spent some time looking to the Bible and picking out all kinds of verses that talked about judgment. And these were the conclusions I came to um, in some verses to supporting it. We won't take time to look up the verses, obviously. From the above verses, it should be clear that one, all of us will be judged by God someday. Uh, many examples, Ecclesiastes 3.17, 11.9, uh, 12, 13, and 14, Isaiah 66, 16, and so forth. Two, God's judgment against the wicked is carried out with fire and sword, Isaiah 66, 16, Jeremiah 25, 31, and Hebrews 10, 27. When the righteous are judged, they will inherit the kingdom of God, Daniel 7, 22. The dead will rise from their graves to be judged. That's all the dead, not just the righteous, but all the dead. 
Um, John 5, 28 to 30, Hebrews 9, 27. When the judgment is complete, the devil, the prince of this world, will be condemned and driven out. John 12, 31 and 16, 11. Six, the judgment is spoken of a still future. Ecclesiastes 12, 13 to 14. And go, come over to, to the New Testament, Matthew 12, 42. Second Peter 2, 4. Second Peter 2, 9. And, and even Jude 1, verse, or Jude chapter, verse 6. Seven, Sodom, Tyre, Sidon, the men of Nineveh, and the queen of the south had apparently not been judged yet in the days of Jesus. Now, many of our Christian friends would suggest that we're all going to our reward at the time we die. Some of us go to heaven, some of us go to hell. That happens right at the time when we die. But the New Testament writers seem to suggest that all these people from the Old Testament are still waiting to be judged. Can, can I just have a little... Interme uh, okay. little interesting here. You read a lot of text, and maybe people didn't get to write them all down. Yeah. Is there a way that they can get these notes? Yes. Yeah. These notes are available on our website. If you look under the teacher's guide for Zechariah under in our at www.theox that's t h e o x dot o r g, theox t h e o x dot o r g, and you'll you'll find these under the under the teacher's guide for the book of Zechariah. Going on, number eight, Satan is the one who accuses us. Zechariah 3, 2 and Revelation 12, 10 to, 7, uh, 10 to 12, where it just specifically says he's the accuser of the brethren there in, in, in Revelation. Um, and then nine, the dead are waiting to be judged. If this is true, they surely cannot already be in heaven or hell, which would suggest they had already been judged. And then we come to 1 Peter 4, 17, 2 Peter 2, 4, um, How do we know so those aren't just the bad people? The good people have gone to heaven, but that, that's just the bad Sodom well, people. Well, the, the, if you try to say that, you've got a problem, because how do you decide who's the good people and who are the bad people unless there's a judgment? Somebody has well, to Well, the judgment's just for the bad people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You have to decide who the bad people are somehow. Well, the ones that are left over. Ones that left aren't in heaven. What? Who decided <laughs> the good ones? See, that's the problem. So, and then you so, come down... So we have to have a special time when all of that's going to happen. We can't, we can't have... God can't say, look, we don't need to... I mean, what about Enoch? Yeah. He, you know, he didn't he have to. He, he, he didn't have to wait. So maybe all these people that are dying and going to heaven, immediately to heaven, maybe they're kind of like Elijah. Couldn't be like either. Well, those two guys. Well, those guys, those two guys went. I mean, they never saw death. So those are bad examples. But <laughs> you're right. <laughs> Very bad. <laughs> but we got Mo. We got Moses. How do we? You know. Well, there's a very interesting passage found in Second Peter two nine. Let's look at that for a second. So, so do we decide exactly what judgment is? Well, what is I'm, I'm saying we, right, right now, I'm just saying it's a way <laughs> where God uses a methodology to decide who's good and who's bad. Doesn't he already know that? Well, he might, but we'll talk about that in a moment. God always conducts his business in the open. He doesn't do things in secret. He's not like governments we know in our world today where, you know, things are decided in, in smoke-filled rooms behind the scenes and nobody else is. Or, you know, the Republicans are over there meeting in their room and the Democrats are over here meeting in their room and they decide things and then they try to force their will on everybody. God doesn't do that. Well, what about, what about, what about uh, in my particular faith, the Adventist faith, we have, a, we have kind of a doctrine that Jesus is going to come back Mm -hmm. And he's going to take the, going to have a resurrection of the righteous, and then he's going to have people who are on the earth that are righteous, and he's going to take those off to heaven. And uh, that means that judgment has taken place, because he had to decide somehow who those righteous people were. Well, because there's what no kind of a deal is that when there's a lot of, I mean, aren't we all supposed to be gathered there together and see all that judgment stuff? Well. If you, if you read John 5, it says, maybe we better go there first. I was going to go to 2 Peter, but look at John 5. I mentioned that as a, as a reference. Let's just look at that. I mean, you know, I draw my conclusions here. 
and you have to John read 5 the, who? John 5, 28 and 29. Okay. Do not be surprised at this. The time is coming when all the dead will hear his voice and come out of their graves. Those who have done good will rise and live, and those who have done evil will rise and be condemned. So all the wicked are going to come out of their graves. Now, you could be a little bit confused there and say, well, when is that? Does that all happen at one time? It turns out that it happens at two different times. According to the book of Revelation, chapter 20, the good ones are going to rise at the beginning of a thousand-year period, and the wicked ones are going to rise at the end of a thousand-year period. But they're all going to rise. Okay. So, and then different things happen to each of these groups based on what they have done in their own lives. They are judged by their works, it says. Why is it important not to have a judgment? Well, I'm, it's, it's obviously going to be a judgment. Um, I, I guess I'm just trying to take the position of those who would believe that when I, if I were to die today and I'm good, I can go right to heaven. I mean, why couldn't my judgment be at that time, and why lay around waiting? Why can't I just go on and on up to heaven? But the problem is, that's making a false assumption. Scripture doesn't support that at all. Just because I believe it doesn't mean that doctrine has to follow it. Well, I, I'm, I'm just kind of wondering about judgment, period. I mean... What exactly you don't think is it? God has to decide. No, I'm just saying that is it a time like the great Perry Mason comes into his courtroom? Nobody knows who's bad. Nobody knows who done it, mm -hmm. and all that. And somehow in that judgment, we straighten everything out. It's mm -hmm. almost like it happens there. It isn't happening as the world goes. You know, mm -hmm. as the world had started and all the things that happened mm -hmm. and then it finally comes to an end where everything is out in the open well, you know well, it's, well, it's well, almost like judgment is a is happening all the time it is and the judgment really is about whether god is doing the right thing in in, in all circumstances the really is first of all you got to settle in your mind that god is righteous and then you can determine whether you tr trust god in his judgment well, Right. But in, in actual fact, what happens is this. Judges are judged by how they judge. That's right. So God will ultimately be judged by how he judges. And that's just what this record is. And that's what this record is. Yeah. So we have to wait and see. That's why God conducts his business in the open. He doesn't do some stuff hidden behind a cloud somewhere, says, okay, here's, I'm going to post this list, here's the ones that are going to be saved, and the rest of you people are lost. No, God says, open the books, Daniel 7 makes it very clear, hundreds of millions of people are watching everything, beings up there in heaven, are watching everything God does. And so, so that's my point, that, that the judgment is happening continuously until well, it gets to the end where everything is out in the open, and everybody yep. kneels before God. Well, that will happen at the very end. Well, that, that's how I'm looking at judgment, that, the whole, that it's a continuous thing. It's not, it's not just an event that's going to happen where they take all the tapes and play them again mm -hmm. and actually live everybody's life again in, in, in some sort of courtroom. It's actually happening right now. I mean, it's Corinthians 4.9. I mean, isn't that, isn't that, we have an investigating well, that, judgment. Okay, but, here's, but here's, here's the issue. Here's the problem. You've got thousands of years of human history. Right. And you need to, you need to put, because this says all the dead are going to rise. Mm -hmm. right. are, are, you think, are they all rising? Are there a bunch of people rising up right now and God's judging them right now? What's, you can't have them rising and going to heaven and then are they going to come back later and be judged? I mean, if you put the Bible verse, I mean, we can theorize all kinds of things. What I'm trying to say is, what does the Bible say? The Bible says the people, the wicked people, particularly, it just specifically mentions them, are waiting until the time of judgment. Well, my and, question is, what does the Bible mean? <laughs> it's not just what it says. What does it mean? Okay, well, tell and me what it means. Then. Well, that's what I'm saying, is that is it, a, is it a point in time when judgment just happens at a point in time, or is it constantly unfolding until the end, till everything is out in the open? 
Well, God's judgment it will be based ultimately on everything he has done and every, how he's related to people all through history. That's true. It's all unfolding now. But at some point in time, every one of us is going to have to make a decision. Do we like what God has done? Do we like what we see? Are we willing to live with him for the rest of eternity? Or we don't like what he's done? We're not happy with what we see. We want to go some other way. So we're, That's we're the question. We're talking about everybody now being We're a talking judge. about everybody. Being a judge. That's right. Actually. And, so, and yeah, that's, that's right. So this is way bigger than a Perry Mason program. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the, every person who, I mean, I just read to you the verse that says everyone who has died is going to be involved. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty big thing. Mm -hmm. Well, let me just look here at Second Peter. Let's read chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. That good man lived among them, and, and day after day he suffered agony as he saw and heard their evil actions. Talking about Jesus here? No, it's talking about any, he's talking about Lot specifically. Yeah. Uh, and so the Lord knows how to rescue godly people from their trials and how to keep the wicked under punishment, or it says for punishment, it could be for punishment or under punishment, for the day of judgment, especially those who follow their filthy bodily lust and despise God's authority. So keep them for punishment? What does that mean? And if you go back to verse 4 in that same chapter, God did not spare the angels who sinned, but threw them into hell. Hell would mean the grave, something like that, where they are kept chained in darkness waiting for the day of judgment. So even the evil angels are waiting for a time when they will be judged. Or uh, the Greek says Tartarus. Yeah. That's kind of a, well, that's, <laughs> they're doing their thing down here all the time. Yeah. Helping conspiracies function. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, seriously, it totally takes two to have a conspiracy. So they're in league. You have uh, joint and several liability. So uh, why responsibility? The question is, why does God conduct his his business in open like this? Well, you know, there are two problems, two things that are happening here. You have the great universe that are looking in on us right now. Mm -hmm. You've got people that only lived their little part of their life and they died. Mm -hmm. They've got to be raised again. So now they get to see what all the angels had seen from the beginning yes. type of thing. And so that could be the reason for, for the saving mm -hmm. for, for punishment. Mm -hmm. It could have that connection there somehow. Okay. Because I think saving for punishment is a... It's kind of a way of saying punishment is sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's got to it's, well, end. Yeah, I don't, it, God wants it, to end it. Fine. Yeah. And, it's gotta and be here's up. the other part of the thing, which we don't have time to talk about right now, but Jesus said very bluntly and very plainly to his disciples, when Lazarus was dead, he said, Lazarus is sleeping. Yeah. John 11. And what he meant was, you know, he, Lazarus didn't know a thing about what was going on. And so God, to God, the first death, the death that was going on on this earth all the time, to God, that first death is nothing more than a sleep. He's going to raise all those people back to life again. And then they're going to face a judgment. And, I mean, the, ex the, the execution of the judgment, the carrying out of the judgment. But that decision has to be made before Jesus comes a second time. And so we have a pre-advent judgment. And it's going on now. God says, you know, look at these records, pay attention, what's going on. Um, and and the, the bottom line right now is this, the angels up in heaven, God is saying to them, okay, look at Ken Hart, for example. Are, are, you, are you going to be willing to live next door to him for the rest of eternity? That's the question. And that's a tough one. And the question I would ask us here, if you had just heard, you know God has a complete knowledge of everything we've ever done. Satan has a pretty complete knowledge of everything we've ever done. Okay, And these two are battling it out over each case. And if, suppose you had sat there and listened to your case, all the best things about you, all the worst things about you, everything. You had heard your case, and God says, okay, we're putting it to a vote. Would you dare to vote for yourself? No. Only by faith in Him. <laughs> well, but what does that mean? That, mean, that means that 
I lost any chance of what divinity has when Adam sinned. Okay. And it was gone permanently until somehow Jesus married humanity and divinity again in his life. Mm -hmm. And he did it perfectly. So humanity can be restored. That's magic. I don't know how it actually happens, but by faith, I believe it does happen. Well, isn't that the question that Satan is dealing with? He was told he cannot be saved. Would you agree with that? Yes. Now he's saying, why is it that you can be saved, but I cannot be saved? Yes. Okay, so what is the answer to that? Well, God answers that. He says, I looked into you, your heart, and you have not changed. You're really the same as you always were, fighting me continually. Is that the same? And if you, yes. And if I were to let you up here, you'd do it all over again so you can't come so back. So why would you say it different to anybody else here on this earth, any other human who have well, sinned? Well, here's, here's the challenge. Why would, you, why would you say that? Why wouldn't you say that to anybody else on the earth who has sinned? Ah, because they, through faith in Christ, have their heart changed. They are a new creature. Mm -hmm. well, totally different. It, 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 and that new creature is savable. Yes. Well, and, and that's the bottom line. Something, something happens, and the angels can... can uh, after God presents his case and Satan presents his, probably Satan presents his case first, and then whatever. God presents his case, whatever they say, when it's all done, and what's all done is said, the angels have to be able to say, that one is savable and that one is not. And that is my mystery right yeah. there. How does he do that? I mean, what you said was wonderful, but how do you prove it? Well, it's not a whole lot, I don't, all that difficult. It's by faith. But Faith I is know. the evidence no, of something no, no, no. not seen. Yes. I know that. I know that. But how do you know if you really have faith or not? Well, but this is, this is the point. God is going to present his case, and he's going to say, he's going to, before the universe, he said, this is, he's going to present not only everything we've done, but everything we've thought, everything like this, sure. and those people will be able to look and say, you know, this one, if he had the opportunity, would live a faithful life, would, would, would fit into heaven. And that one over there, he is a rebel. He, he, he just, there's, it's not safe to, and the criteria, the bottom line is, which one is going to be safe to live next door to for the rest of eternity and which one is not. Okay, and they see, they process, were, I have no idea <laughs> what's gonna ha yeah. how that's going to happen. Yeah. How, how there's, there isn't any example of anybody having their thoughts turned out so you can actually see it. You can How see do you do that? You can see their actions. Yeah. Are, yeah. They, are they attracted to mm -hmm. learning, learning the, the lessons, or do they go off and do their own thing? And, and do they have any time for, for, no, for, for spiritual they, matters? Or they, they, that's what the book of Job was all about. It's to show that God can yeah. look at the heart. He can read in there and say, here's the way he's going to act. And Job proved him right. It's a book about yeah. God's foreknowledge. That's a book about God's foreknowledge, exactly. And so he uses that to make that decision. Okay, so and, and he he's makes able that to. decision, so he's going to make that pronouncement to all these people. Absolutely. These people over here, but not these people, but these people over here. It's more than that. It's more than that. He's going to be able to display the issues, whatever they are, however they are, however he does that. He's going to be able to, to portray that in sufficiently cl sufficient clarity that everyone there is, get, is going to be able to say, that one, I vote for this one, I can't vote for that one. Romans 5.10, we're reconciled by Jesus' death. Are you, do you have any interest in that? And we're healed by his life. And if you don't have any interest in that, it's pretty relatively obvious to, to those that are looking on where you, where you made your decision. It doesn't, it's not a... So no you're trickery. going to be able to see the interest somehow. I don't see how you can help it uh, do you it any will, other way. You will well, see I'm, it. That's only one part no, of it. it, maybe. it, it, may be, it may be, God sees it. It may be difficult to see it now, but when the crunch comes, yeah. the sheep will be separated from the goats, and and it'll be obvious. It's.
Now it's the crunch isn't here. The we crunch, only got yeah, but how about the crunch? How about the other crunch? By their work, she shall live. How about the crunch that hasn't happened yet for the people? We've died, only got a couple know? minutes left, and I, <laughs> I need to ask one more really important question. In light of all that, do we need an intercessor? What do you mean by that? Well, that's a famous word in some circles. An intercessor, a mediator, an intervener. Not and because so, we're afraid of the infinite one. We're, we're, that's what God is. In this is, judgment we've been talking about now, do we need someone to speak on our behalf? You think we're going to be able to answer that in the next one minute and 55 seconds? I'm going to seconds? ask you to summarize in the next 25 <laughs> seconds. It's, it's the same idea as having a lawyer now if you're involved or accused of a crime. Mm -hmm. It's just a celestial lawyer. That's our intercessor. And we don't need that anymore? God is going no. to present the truth. I can't. And when he does, everybody accepts it. Yeah. And that is very clear. The place where it's most clear in all of scriptures is in Romans 8. And it says right there, the Father's on our side, the Spirit is on our side, and certainly Jesus is on our side. In other words, all three members of the Godhead will, will, will vote for us if they, if they can dare to do so. And that's what mountains counts and it, and in the bottom line and I'll, I'll I'll put my I'll put my opinion out there on the deck I'll say this the kingdom of God for, for now for all eternity past and for all eternity in the future operates on the basis of love amen Satan's kingdom has always operated on the basis of selfishness so that is going to be the ultimate criteria that's been the criteria all through scripture it was all the way from Leviticus to all the way through the New Testament. That's always the criteria. And when God looks down here on this earth and starts judging, he's going to say to his, everybody looking on, okay, is this a loving life? Is this a selfish life? Is this a loving life? Is this a selfish life? And that's going to be the ultimate criteria. And you know, there's lots of ramifications of that, I understand. And, and Jay's question, no, I'm not going to spell it all out. And, but and I can say enough to, 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 I think, say what it's all about. And God says, he says, that's my child. I want him to live with me forever. And here's why. And the angel said, God, you're right. And other times God's weeping says, I can't say that. Thank you for joining us. See you again next time.